Hey, buenas, buenas. Half a day, half a day. I still give an ocean episode for Natsu. Why host me to tell us in Michael Luhan Bavakwa? And I'm very happy for this episode of Fenatsu to bring back one of our longest running guests on Fenatsu. You've heard him talk about um, decolonization in the past. You've heard him talk about our rights to moral self-determination. You've heard him talk about why it's not racist to support moral self-determination. You've also heard him talk about breaking down our political status into very practical ways of understanding it, right? And so I'm very glad to bring back uh, onto Fenatsu Ipaidekunai, my party. See, Ed Alvarez, buenas, Ed, half a day. Buenas, Mike. Hungan. And so Ed is, um, you know, Ed and I have, we've known each other for more than 10 years now. And so I'm always happy to bring back Ed because we we come at the political status uh, uh issue from, from different perspectives. For me, as somebody who's younger and newer to it, but for Ed, he was somebody who was there and just when the discussions around Commonwealth were happening, you know, when, uh, when there was, when this issue was really taking shape in the community, um, really becoming for the first time a subject of debate. And so I'm always glad to, to bring in Ed's perspective um, for this. Uh, if you're not familiar with his background, he was the Commission uh, on Decolonization Executive Director under Governor Eddie Calvo for a number of years, and he was instrumental in restarting the work of that commission. After more than 10 years of no formal meetings, almost, almost no sort of uh, government-led educational campaigns around political status, um, Ed, Ed uh, under uh, Eddie Calvo helped get it started and also helped make it possible for there to be funds, educational funds, uh, to be used by the task forces. And so, Ed, thank you so much for, for joining again. And so, can you just share with us real quick, when did you first start getting interested in these issues like decolonization? Oh, it was in 1979 at the University of Guam. Um, I read its document called the Solomon Report that was smuggled out of the enabled shipyard by a person from Palau. And some of the copies circulated to Guam. And I was fortunate to read the, the original copy. Not, it wasn't redacted. And I was blown away because up until that time, I didn't realize how colonized I was. I didn't realize how there was, you know, there was plots against us. There's, you know, this, this country, the United States that stood for freedom and democracy had a very dark underbelly as well in, in plotting against island nations like us. And we weren't the only ones. They, they did this around the world. So that made me stop and think that, gosh, you know, maybe, maybe it's time we get out on our own and get our own experiences and, you know, be more self-governed and modernized than we were. So at that time, I was really good friends with uh, Leland Bettis. And Leland and I had all these talks, you know, prior to this. And I got really involved. And uh, one day I pitched this to my good buddy, Eddie Calvo. And we had a very furious argument about self-determination and capitalism and I, I, we almost we almost hit each other, but about a, a week or two later, he called me up and he was almost crying, and he realized that my God, Ed, not everybody lives like me. And if at that time his his family owned a construction supply company called PCC, 
And he, I think he was sent down to Agate to deliver some rebarbs and cement or, or concrete blocks. And he saw, he saw this low cost housing project called Pagachao at that time. And he freaked out that, my God, there are people here that they're, they don't have window panes, their house is barely livable, but they're existing. And so begrudgingly at that time, he, he realized that, well, what Ed was saying was right. And over time, all the way up until he was elected governor, he, he, he's evolved into realizing and being more even keeled on our political status and our need to modernize our political relationship. And that's why in the beginning of his term, you know, he reignited this discussion. He, he actually had a commission that functioned, that had meetings, that went to UN seminars, that went around the region telling our story, that went out to schools and provided outreach to all the kids. Um, you know, we had to think outside the box at that time, Mike, because we didn't have any money. In fact, I didn't even get paid for that year. But in my mind, it wasn't about money at all. It was about getting the awareness out to our youth. And I chose the youth, namely people in high schools, because they were innocent. Their messaging about decolonization and injustices and all that, it was, it was, it was raw. You know, they didn't have any. So I felt if we had a vote another four to six years, maybe, these people would be at least basic in understanding. So I had to think outside the box. I didn't have any money. I didn't have an office, but I went out to all the schools. I went out to all the organ civic organizations I could, and I started spreading awareness that way. Then we got invited to the UN seminars. We got invited to the C4 meetings in New York, the C24 meetings, and we started an upswell of awareness. All the way up until 218, we we progressed so much that it was a major gubernatorial issue for the election of 218. And that's when I realized, wow, we, we really did a lot, our commission, you know, we really did. We flew under the radar, but once we got money, we couldn't fly under the radar anymore because there's all these people waiting to get some money. So it was good, you know, and I did have a meeting with Eddie Calvo and I told him, look, man, we, we've pushed this thing as far as we can without any money. If you're not gonna give me any money, then shut me down. But you know, Eddie, Eddie, this is in Eddie's heart. This was a top priority. So he um, he came through with the money, you know. And then we got a three hundred thousand dollar grant from uh, Department of Interior under mm -hmm. Esther Kayana, and you know that put us over a million bucks, man. And that was a great start. Biba, Ed, let's. Uh, you've mentioned a few things, and so you know, for me as a historian, I always like to document things, and even recent history too people get kind of frustrated with me because I'm like, no, let's, let's remember, let's not just focus on our ancient past. Let's remember those who are pushing for empowerment and a better community even more recently too. And so I wanted to share some images from some of the things that you're talking about. And so let's uh, give me a second because there's a whole bunch of them. And so here we go. This is the, this was the first commission on decolonization meeting in more than 10 years that there hadn't been any towards the end of Carl Gutierrez's second term, and there wasn't a single one under Felix Camacho's uh, term, under his two terms. And so this was sort of the first, the first formal meeting of the commission. This is uh, 2011? 20... 2011. Yeah, and so... Uh, Hey, Aten, Aten wow. I, had, I had more hair. <laughs> <laughs> and so what were you what were you feeling? You know, what was it like sort of uh to take on this? Did you know so to prepare yourself for it? Did you reach out to people? Uh because there had still been some education going on, like in the community, activists and scholars sort of doing work. The government had been absent for a long time. And so how did you sort of uh, prepare? Well, remember, um, this meeting was in September of 2011. We had a stakeholders meeting in April, if you recall. And um, at that meeting, we got all the stakeholders of, you know, all the organizations. And, you know, we had a good two, two and a half hour meeting. And the takeaway I got from that meeting was 
Everybody agreed that we need to decolonize, but how we do it was we were worlds apart. We didn't agree on how it should be done. Everybody had their own perspective on how it should be done. So this meeting uh, in September, I took that into consideration that the stakeholders, although they all agreed, we were worlds apart on how we should do it. So I prepared this meeting and then we, we sent a letter off. I don't know if you remember, but we sent a letter off to uh, George, President George Bush at the time, I think, telling him that we are interested and we are reigniting and you know we'd like his support. And I think we sent another letter off something. But anyway, this was a good first meeting because um, you got to see who is on the commission you got to see what their perspectives was, or you be begin to realize what their perspectives was. And we had a lot of meetings at, you know, we had quite a few meetings. That, oh, is that Dave Davis? My God. <laughs> so anyway, that, that was the impetus of us starting, you know, uh, our, our reigniting of this discussion and of modernizing our political status. Hungan Denancio, as you see Dave Davis. Gi Rincon at Job Lugi Rincon, the devil in the corner. <laughs> we should have let him register. Oh, Hungan. Yeah, why not? Why not? Let but, him um, register. <laughs> and so, one thing that, uh, you know, was important uh, under during your time was the reconnection. You mentioned it earlier to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Is that. Um, uh, during during Felix Camacho's time and during Gutierrez uh, Carl Gutierrez's time, uh, there was invitations regularly for for uh, the governor uh, or representatives to go to the UN to go to the the C twenty four or the regional seminars, the conferences where they gather testimony on what's going on in the in the non self governing territories, and so people were going to these sometimes as experts, sometimes as representing the government. Um, but sort of you, uh, as the executive director of the commission on decolonization with a, co with a commission that was a meeting, you know, you, uh, represented a, a big shift in sort of, uh, in, the, in these meetings. And so, um, what was it like uh, sort of going back to the United Nations, uh, bringing well, was, back to the United Nations? Well, I'm, I'm. I, 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 we went seven years in a row. We went to all the seminars in the, the Pacific and Atlantic region. We went to, or, or we, we went to, or we sent testimony to the C4 and the C24. Uh, my experience there was, wow, we're not the only ones. We, we, we have problems, man, but there's, there's non-self-governing territories that got it worse than us. But it made me realize that it was good to form an alliance with the, the US territories. And you'll see in this picture, you'll see uh, Wilma Colago from Puerto Rico, Dan Aga from Samoa, Carlisle Corbin, my good buddy and brother from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And, you know, every, every year we had these things, we, we always got together at some point and started discussing stuff, started trading information, started understanding that, well, what happens on Guam is very similar to what happens in Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and at, at times in Samoa. So this was good, you know, to, and, and Carlisle also uh, introduced us to other forums like the Pacific Island Forum. And there's other forums that I, I can't remember right now, but uh, you know, we had opportunities to either be observers or be a member, I think. And uh, you know, at that time, you know, we were in a deficit. If you remember correctly, we were in a $330 million deficit. You and I, Mike, spent our own money going to Palau and Okinawa. And I spent a lot more of my money going to Taiwan, Australia, China, I mean, not China, Australia, uh, Korea, Vietnam. And every, everywhere I went, you know, uh, I, I told our story to these two officials. And I think what happened was, you know, this groundswell of awareness, you know, worked its way up through channels to the UN. And in 2017, I believe at that delegation meeting, we got our own resolution if you remember correctly. And that was the first time we ever got our own re resolution. Of course, it was watered down later by, you know, who, but, you know, just the fact that all that groundwork we did, all the seminars and symposiums and meetings we had, 
a lot of it on our own dime. You know, we we really made a big dent in this region. Oh, definitely, definitely. And so you've mentioned some of the other trips that we've taken. Let's talk a little bit about Palau, because with our good friend, here we go. Teneste dos pescadot. Yeah, I remember you gave him a knife. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, for my grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was good. It was good to meet Tommy Remengasau. Uh, he definitely identified with our struggle, uh, having been through it himself. Uh, and remember also we met with, uh, I think then speaker, Sarango Whips, who is now their president. I've known Sarango way before I met him when he was a senator. Um, I went down there with my, my Pari and my very close cousin, Lorenzo Flores, and we met Sarango and we stayed at his house and we went fishing together and we talked, you know, and the guy, the guy had it going and he, he knew exactly what path they needed to go in. And he encouraged me to never stop fighting for Guam's right. You know, they said, they gave you this right. It's inalienable. Although they never gave you a time certain, you should never stop fighting for it. You should always, always promote it no matter what. Mm. Again, again, and this was a this was a very eye opening trip uh, for me. This was the first and only time that I'd ever been to Palau, and so after he, reading so much about it, uh, you know, but then sort of visiting there and then talking to some of their leaders, I I remember uh, you know that President Ramengasau had some, as you said, some some important words you know for us to hear, especially coming from a, a community, you know, that is smaller than Guam, you know, but, uh, but still sort of feeling that pride, right? Yeah. Feeling that pride and that need to kind of move ahead, take care of your own community, right? It's something that, that you know, for many people on Guam, they feel trapped in independency. They feel like we shouldn't change. We shouldn't do anything because it, you know, we don't want to upset Uncle Sam. We don't want to lose all of the money that they give us. Uh, but I liked what President Romangasau and other Palauan leaders that we talked to, I liked what they said. Yeah. Yeah, they're very uh, insightful. And, you know, I look at them as a, uh, they're a very good source of experience in their case for self-determination. They're very good for us to, you know, gather as much information we can. And, uh, you know, and that's one thing I always testified about in the UN was that, um, you know, two things I always advocated. First, they need a UN mission, a visit here. And second, they needed to uh, give the case studies of all the FSM, Palau and uh, Marshall Islands to us so we can know what to expect when it comes to negotiating. You know, those are two things I've often asked for um, in my testimonies. I said, how can we be prepared to negotiate when we, they won't even give us the cases uh, of these island nations to study so that we can be prepared? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, a very good, a very good point. You know, that uh, Guam, in some ways we are unfortunate because so many have gone before and already decolonized yeah. but then so in one way that makes it unfortunate but in another way it makes it possible for us to learn from those who have gone before and what, what their mistakes their successes right exactly you know and you you look at those cases with the fsm palau and the marshall islands there was no dave davis case nobody protested their inalienable right to choose what they wanted and modernize their political relationship nobody and so I'm, you know, I was behooved that, my God, well, why, why is there such a big controversy on Guam? You know, um, this is already set precedent. You know, and there's there's over 81 island nations and countries that have gone through this the same way. And why now all of a sudden is it different for, for us? You know, and based on a vote, a, an amendment in the constitution that really has nothing to do with us. You know, it has everything to do with the UN Charter. But the courts didn't see it that way. 
And that, that's unfortunate because the UN Charter is federal law. It's a law as well. You know, so, mm -hmm. but you know, that's, that's one thing we learned, Mike, is, you know, you, you, you make the rules, but you can break the rules too. Yeah, that's the, it's good you know, to be the colonizer, right? It's good to yeah, be the and, colonizer. And, and you know what, Mike, we, you know, recently at my house when we got together last time, we talked about how not much has changed in the way the military treats us. And I, I gave you some examples of what happened to me. Uh, you know, we, we went to a rededication of Camp Bloss. And if you recall, I had two news crews from Okinawa that had come and we drove up to the gate and we told the guard, you know, hey, this is what we're here for. And the guard had no knowledge, no knowledge of the reenactment ceremony. Although it was all over the media, it was in the news. They said they didn't know anything about it. And I, you know, got all the credentials from the news reporters and I gave them their, you know, their invitation letter from the Admiral and everything. And they this, said, oh, we yes, still don't know about it. These were Okinawan, Okinawan media. Okinawan, yeah. yeah. They, uh, they were Okinawan news crews. They were the RBC and the QAB um, networks. And these guys were like, God, you know, what's going on here? You know, we, we flew a long time. We we're paying this on our own dime. And now you're telling us you don't know anything about this, even though we're showing you the letter from the Admiral and the, the credential request. And so anyway, the, the girl said, hey, I don't know anything. I have to call my supervisor. So she gets on the radio with the supervisor and the supervisor comes down with his sirens and his car, he blocks the road, gets out and he's holster ready. And I was like, God dang, what are we terrorists, man? I mean, I really, is this necessary? So anyway, the girl said, I'm sorry, you're, you're now an unidentified car. I have to take your picture of the car. And I was like, well, that's not going to help you. This is a rental. It's not going to help you <laughs> identify me. But so anyway, we were, as, you know, politely escorted off the base. And there were about 10 cars behind me that I'm sure were there for the same reason. And they all left. And that, you know, that, that made me realize, man, nothing's changed. We're, we're, we're still going to be treated like this, you know. Although there is a profession of one Guam, one approach, one this, one island, one this. But, you know, it's not true, man. It's not true. And, you know, we, we even have more examples of how they desecrate our, our historical uh, sites up there on the base. Maneka Flores told me that uh, she went to the rededication and there was a memorial for a set of bones that were dug up or desecrated. But she noticed that there were over 20 other mounds of bones that had nothing for them. And so, you know, they did one and go, oh, look, what, what could be done for you? You know, you should be happy, you know, but she's like, first of all, that's improper. Second of all, what about all those other mounds? You know, all those other sites of bones. So, you know, I really realized that it's not, you know, it's a one-sided deal. Although they try to act like it, you know, we're a partner, you know, we want to help you, we want to contribute to the community. That's, that's nothing that has changed from World War II. The only thing different is they're a little bit more nicer about it. Mm. It's, it's interesting because we've, uh, to, you know, um, we've spent a fair amount of time in Okinawa together, being invited to, to go there for, for conferences, uh, and to to work with activists there, and so um, hold on one second. Let me get a. And so uh, Okinawa is is fascinating because Okinawa is in some ways slightly similar to Guam, yeah. sort of has a territorial colonial history in relation to Japan. There is a small but dedicated, and it was growing in recent years, sort of movement for autonomy or sovereignty or independence, right? And so this is us uh, in 2013, when we yep. uh, presented at one of their uh, sort of, this, one of their symposiums, I think this was uh, focused on sort of the, the betrayal of the, of when Okinawa was given back to Japan, rather yeah. than sort of as, rather than sort of giving its, being given its autonomy, it was returned as sort of territory to Japan in 1972 right and so uh but you know we've visited okinawa and we've been to protests in okinawa we've met with 
uh, elders, activists. This is us when we met with the former governor, Masahide Ota. Um, you know, and this was just a few years before he passed away, but it was it was amazing that we got to spend time with him and and through Shinako, our friend and translator, sort of hear about his story, his experiences when he visited Guam, uh, for example. And so one thing that, you know, that that I always appreciate is that, you know, in Okinawa, their relationship to the military is that they don't see it as their best friend, as their buddy, you know they see it as sort of this this big presence that takes up a lot of space um, and sort of isn't always welcome. Whereas in Guam, because we are, quote unquote, where America's day begins, we're the tip of America's spear. There's so many people, locals who are in the military. It's harder to see it in objective or in practical ways because you feel the history of World War II you feel all of these people that are in the military, right? So it's harder to see the fences in a critical way. Um, but let's let's talk about Okinawa. Sort of, uh, what was? Uh, yeah, we've been we've been there several times, talking to people in their in their in their movements for language revitalization, for cultural revitalization, for decolonization. This is a. Uh, this is a, is this Shinako's house? Shinako's family's yeah, house? Yeah, it's the real house in Naha. Yeah. And so a, a gathering of different activists. Uh, this is when we traveled there and we presented at Ryukyu University. And right. so many of these are language PhDs or language uh, professors or students, people who study the uh, Utsinaguchi or U- U- Utsinatsu. 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 Uchinanshu, the the Okinawan language or its dialects. Yeah. And so talk to us, because I think a lot of people in Guam, a lot of people who are Chamorro, understand Okinawa primarily through U.S. military service, because they get stationed there or they know about it from World War II. But talk to us about sort of uh, the real Okinawa. As you and I know, you know, there's a whole new world other than the military in Okinawa. These people have their own historical roots and their culture, their you know folk ways, their mores, their laws and customs, and they're very similar to us. Uh, these people are also farmers and fishermen uh, historically, and you know when we got over there, we realized, my God, they they're so much like us. They have respect for the for the jungle. They have respect for the ocean. They don't take more than they need. They uh, have respect for each other. They, you know, it was very similar to us, you know. And we, I mean, we remember uh, going up throughout Okinawa, we realized, my God, they got all the fruits and vegetables that we have, except for coconut. They don't have coconuts there, it's too cold. But we realized that, my God, there's such a parallel between the two of us, the, our, our cultures. And that's why we fit in so well with them is because we can, you know, it's easier when you're similar in culture to, to get along than when you're not, you know, and I just want to say, look, I'm not anti us, as you know, I always recognize them for the good they do on the Island. And I just want to make that clear that I don't want anyone to think that I'm anti us. Hey, I can call them out for what I know is true, but it doesn't mean that I'm totally against them because they do do some good things. And I mentioned they've kept the land they took pristine for the most part. Uh, over the years, except now they're building up for the, you know, for, you know, their fortification against uh, you know, North Korea and China. And, you know, they do a lot of civic, you know, things here. But, you know, I, I realize this, thinking out of the box, Mike, I realize this, you know, we're not going to stop this military buildup. Sorry. We just don't have it in the cards to stop it. But that's not to say that we should get a more even cut of the money that comes in here. Because people on Guam, um, for the most part, when they read in the paper that billions of dollars are coming for Guam for the next seven years, billions and billions, that's true. It is coming, but it ain't staying here. It's not staying here. A lot of that money's gonna go back where it came from, from those contractors that came from the States that have those huge military contracts. They're not gonna circulate it in our economy for the most part. They'll They'll pay their taxes, uh, and that's about it. 
And, and I think if we're going to put ourselves out and be a target, be a bigger target because of uh, expanded military presence, then my God, they got to do their part and give us some kind of gratuity, you know, so that we can circulate in our own economy and build our own developments. That's only fair, you know, that they give, they, they give some, they leave something on Guam for, for it to circulate a certain amount of money. I don't know what that number is, but it's got to be better than what we're getting now because we're not mm-hmm. getting enough. Because if, if, if really it was true that all this money is coming here and it's presumed that it's staying here, then we wouldn't have dilapidated schools. Schools. We wouldn't have an ICE epidemic. We wouldn't need to fund more police officers. That money would already be more than enough to, and, and a hospital, to, to build a hospital and to do all that other stuff that I mentioned. But because it doesn't stay here, that's why we are in the condition we're in. You know, we just mm. uh, not getting the split we should get. You know, okay. although, although, you know, it, it, one can say, it, 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 you know, it's, it's enough for them, but, you know, not everybody lives like, like, like I told you, not everybody lives like everyone else. Mm-hmm. We have 50% of our population is that's below the poverty line. Okay. And above that, another, another 30 to 35% that just paycheck to paycheck. You know, that's, that's what it is. And, you know, I, I see this thinking out of the box, I see people being forced to grow their own chickens, raise their own, you know, grow chickens, raise their, you know, get eggs and fruits and vegetables. They're going to have to find a way to be less reliant on the federal government and the local government. And that's, that's thinking out of the box. Mm. You know, you start reducing your expenses that you normally would pay, you know, so that you don't have to pay for them. Mm. So, you know, that's just part of the thing that, you know, we were were talking about this, Mike, about doing Mm. this. You know, and I think it's it's as prices be you know continue to increase because we know that there's there, it's still going to go up. You know, the Gulf Guam just got a 22 percent raise. I'm happy for all those people that got their raises, but we know the net effect of any raise Gulf Guam gets is prices go up again, mm. and um, you know it, people are going to be forced to think outside the box and and do this, or else they get up and leave. And, you know, you, you see the indicators here, Mike. You see the fiestas are dying. Back in the 80s, 90s, and even as much as the 2000s, you still had a lot of fiestas. But today, last year, you go around every village and it's one or two, even in the South. So that's an indicator of the times that are happening. Mm. Then now you have all the panhandlers. We never had panhandlers before. We never had people asking for money. So, so that shows you that the social fabric of the family is breaking down. That people who used to take care of their own are now letting them go on the streets and fend for themselves. And then you have the third indicator, which you see a lot of people leaving Guam. You know, mm-hmm. and one, one way I know that is because I finally went back to my village and I went to church where I went to church since I was young. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in that church. And that was alarming. I was like, wow. And that, that goes true for any church I go to. It's very rare that I find people I know. Not like before in the 70s and 80s. I, you know everybody in that church. Mm. So, you know, I'm glad we're talking about thinking outside the box. You know, I, I think I may get a few examples of what we're going to have to do. You know, and as, and as the, the economy rebounds, it's not rebounding fast enough. Mm. But, you know, inflation is, is really going through the roof. So, you know, we, we, we on Guam now have to make a decision. Do we, do we make more, spend less, leave the island, or start being self-sufficient? Mm. No, so just Masi, I think, um, I think thinking outside the colonial box, I think that what you're describing there is a good way to start, right? Because you're talking about, there's all these ways that Guam has kind of developed over the past few generations, and some of them improve our lives. Some of them don't necessarily improve our lives, sort of like, a, you know, so disconnection from the land. You know, it doesn't necessarily improve your life, right? Because, um, you know, if you, uh, if you have the ability to farm or to fish or to get food other ways, 
it means that you're in an even better position because you can still buy stuff from the store. Yeah. But if you can only buy things from the store and you can't sustain yourself in any other way, it's not, not a great position to be in. And so sort of, uh, but this is kind of the trend as Guam has become more urbanized. So many people displaced from their land, right? And so um, some people, you know, have land, have yards, could do some farming. Other people, you know, uh, live in apartment complexes. So finding options for that sort of thing might be a little bit more difficult. But I think what I like about what you're suggesting, though, is that the first step, though, is that to kind of push back against sort of the system that is that is changing things on Guam, right? So to kind of take a step and say, no, like, I don't want to lose this sense of community anymore, or no, you know what? I don't want to be disconnected from the land. I'm going to try to reconnect my family to it. And it's hard. It's hard. Not everybody can do it easily because it may take time. It may take resources. But I think that these are important first, first things, right? Because, you know, we look at other islands around the Pacific and they're stopping the importation of things like plastic bottles because they realize that, well, once you drink it, then all you have is this waste. And if you bury enough of it in the ground, it affects your water supply. Or you have to pay somebody to ship it off. So yeah. why don't we think ahead and just prevent these things from coming in and then develop other ways of, of getting drinks, right? And you and I so, have spoke about, uh, we've spoke about, I'm sorry, Mike, but we've spoke about learning the language, learning your culture. You know, I was very taken when I heard your daughter speak Chamorro and she was like seven at the time. And it, 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 it ate at me. It ate at me so bad. And I was like, my God, this girl can speak this fluently. And here I am. So, you know, I began to ask you stuff, you know, go to your classes a little bit, you know, and I've gotten better. I'll tell you, I felt really liberated, you know, just knowing that. Then, you know, growing up being a fisherman, you know, and, and learning how to fish traditional. And that, that helped, that, that was really, made me realize that, man, I can do something that a lot of people can't. That was liberating too. So, you know, we spoke about learning your culture, learning your language, learning your history. I think a lot of people here don't know enough about Chamorro history. They know a lot about the U.S. history, but they don't know a lot about their own history. And I think if people objectively got a chance to understand what has happened to our people over the last 3,000, 4,000 years, then, you know, you feel liberated in knowing, my God, you know, we, we, are, we are a special people. We are indigenous. We have a language that a lot of people can't understand. We do things dif differently from other people. I think that's thinking outside the box right now. Because right now we're inundated with Xbox, PlayStation, iPad, you know, you name it. That's where our kids are going right now. You know, and it's, it's sad because that's not us. It's enjoyable. I'm not going to say it's not. I like the Aircon. I like the cable TV and all. But, you know, we should always put some time aside every day to reconnect to our roots. We should. We should always understand where, we, where have we been? Where have we as a people been? What are we doing? Where are we going? Mm -hmm. You know, those are very conscientious thoughts that those discussions need to happen a lot more than, than it's happening now. But I am proud, you know, that there are a group of people, actually a, a growing group of people that are doing this. You know, they're, they're reconnecting back. There's, there's dance troops. There's a cultural center. There's, you know, things that we never had in the past because all the time, all that time was at our house where you learn how to build a palapala. You learn how to do the fem, uh, femas and saina. You learn how to, you know, you, you know about all this. It was their house. But now things have changed, you know. We have new new methods of doing things, new technology, and, you know, out with the old, in with the new. But that makes it even more valuable to know who are you, where you can, where do you come from, what are you about? Again, definitely, because I think um, in thinking about sort of being trapped in the colonial box, right, the less grounded and rooted you feel, 
the easier it is for somebody to take advantage of you. Exactly. The easier it is if if you struggle and aren't certain about who you are, it's easier for somebody to come and tell you who you are and say, you know what? You need me. You can't yeah. survive without me. Take yeah. what I need. And because that's, you know, that's why that's why I always tell you know people that going back to the language, before World War II, Chamorros spoke Chamorro. And then when the US started to prohibit Chamorro, Chamorros didn't stop speaking it. They kept mm-hmm. speaking it. They kept using it. But they also learned English. So by 1941, Guam was, according to the U.S. Navy, you know, 80 percent bilingual. But everybody could speak English functionally, but also spoke Chamorro because Chamorro said, we don't want to give up our language. We know who we are. But the 1950s come around, the 1960s. That's when you see the language start to disappear because that rootedness, because there's all these changes. Chamorro start to leave the island. There's all this displacement. Thousands of families lose their land after World War II. Urbanization, right? And so then what we hear is Chamorro saying, you know what? We shouldn't speak Chamorro to the kids because it'll mess up their education. It'll mess up their mind if we, it'll damage them if we do that. And that's all just believing what the Americans said, whereas Chamorros didn't believe that before. That's right. Yeah, he's exactly right. And that, you know, that I'm, I'm a living example of that. My parents didn't want to teach us Chamorro because they didn't want people laughing at our accent. And in my mind, what's so wrong about an accent? What's so wrong about it? There's hundreds of accents, you know, that people, they don't speak perfectly, but nobody's laughing at them. And so that was, you know, something I kind of like was a little hurt. I was hurt by my parents like this. Man, I'll tell you, Mike, it's, it's tough to learn, you know, it, 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 when, when you're already, you know, a 60 year old man, it's, it's, it's tough to learn, you know, it's tough to learn, you know, it, any other language. But if you're a kid, you know, it's easier for you to learn because you absorb it like a sponge. And I wish I had that opportunity, you know, because it's, it's not bad to be bilingual at all. It, to me, it's a big plus, you know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, I'm, no, a, I'm, I'm much better. Hungan, <laughs> I'm much better now. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. No, Hungen, because all the, I'll tell you, uh, for those of you watching, I'm Ed and I and uh, and our Paris Juan and Jesse, we have a, a Pari chat and Toto Champu, Fumunotsu Momoru si Ed gi chat nai. Ed's always, uh, always uh, texting in Chamorro, you know, starting the day off in Chamorro. Go maulika no, ibidadamu Ed san. It's it's easier for me to text. So there's no pressure. Yeah, hungen hungen in again. But she tried to speak in like she's it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but yeah, man, you know we we did a lot, Mike. You know we at times you know we probably feel we don't get enough credit, but that that's okay because it it really it really it really makes me realize how much we did when kids that I talked to 10, 12 years ago remember what I told them. And they come up to me, hey, man, Jones Act, man, I got it. And I was like, well, okay, he remembers it, right? Remembers all these things that, you know, it, it, it's worth it. So, and then that we had to think outside the box, Mike, at that time, because we didn't have any money. I'm happy. I, I got a state for the record that I'm happy that Lulian Guerrero, uh, you know, has, has, has continued our work. She put a good guy in there in Melbourne, Wampat, Borja. And for the most part, you know, he's got staff, he's got money. You know, and that's good. I'm glad that we're continuing that. That, that, that that's that's a good feather in her cap. Hungen, no Hungen. I'm I'm glad too. I'm glad too. Um, Hungen, go from Maliki Bidadanya, see Melvin. I think, uh, and I wanted to share some of the resources that he's put out there. And so, um, I know that uh, Ed, when you were executive director of the commission. Uh, the self-governance start study, the process was started, and then it was continued under Amanda Bloss, who followed you, and then it was eventually finished under under Melvin. And so I wanted to share with everybody uh, some uh, the Commission on Decolonization, and I'll put the link in the chat if you'd want to check it out, because they have a wide variety of free resources. Some of them are physical copies that you can uh, that you can check out. Some of them are digital, and so let's uh, 
let's just check real fast. Uh, one of their short videos. Self-determination is a right of a people to determine their political destiny. It is a right of people and not of land. The United States is not recognizing us as the indigenous people of these islands of the Marianas. Um, but we don't have the choice. After we have all of this education, after we really understand what the current status means, what does it entail, and then what do these other status options provide or offer to us, now we have to make a decision. Now we have to decide, okay, for ourselves, what do we want? Under colonial rule, imperialist laws, we have suffered much in the hands of the colonizer. And the political progression of the people was guaranteed, but how have we gone forward from that? It, it's just completely unfair to our people. Which is, in essence, a modern-day colony. Biba, biba, biba. So it's good to see all of these uh, resources out there. Again, and so, Ed, let's um, let's let's take a moment though to kind of re reflect. Um, how do you think the pandemic has impacted, uh, sort of this the movement, the educational movement that we've been talking about? Because um, I think uh, I would agree with you that when uh, the election for twenty eighteen came around, political status was, if you know, most front and center. Because, I mean, you look at uh, in uh, 2018, they had the one Guam towards decolonization debate in which, you know, each candidate had to, you know, and the debate was basically focused on political status. And this was huge because I remember um, going back, you know, to, to gubernatorial elections in the 80s and 70s. And if you asked a candidate, what do you think about political status? They would basically say nothing because... It, who cared? It wasn't a major issue, right? It wasn't front and center. Now, do you feel that the pandemic has has disrupted a lot of that momentum that you helped create and then others sort of built from there? Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, don't don't exclude yourself. You were you were instrumental in building this momentum as well. Um, but yes, it has, you know, and it, it because of the restrictions that that were put in place to promote health and safety. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't envy Melvin being put in that position where he couldn't go out and do outreach. He couldn't go out to civic organizations and get on the media and all that, you know, um, and plus he couldn't travel regionally to, to, to reinforce the message that was sent out there previously by us. So yes, it definitely has, it, and it, 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 it affected the whole world. It's, it's just not here, you know, uh, the, our lives changed definitely during the pandemic, you know, the, there was just, and, and it had a huge impact on people's mental health, um, people's, uh, you know, outlook on life. Um, it, it had a huge impact on that. So yeah, you know, the pandemic uh, did, did thwart the, uh, the momentum, but, you know, Melvin's kept it alive, you know, no doubt, you know, he's got that book. Guillamona, he's got two videos that are on public, uh, we're, you know, we're on PBS. He's got a lot of, uh, a lot of other outreach. He's, he's done, uh, you know, as good as he could do during the epidemic, you know, plus he's still been engaged with all the regional seminars. And those are very important to, to attend, you know, those uh, regional seminars, uh, the UN host every year, plus the, the meetings in New York, you know, because if we don't go, uh, I, I think what will happen if we don't go is, somebody's gonna take a picture of the empty Guam chair with the name tag on it, Guam, and they'll say, see, they're not interested anymore. You know, and uh, I'm glad that, you know, despite on, uh, on how everything happened during the pandemic, you know, the, the, the movement's still alive. It's, it's still, they're still meeting. They're still, you know, active in doing things. And, you know, and that's better than having nothing at all, you know, like, like we had pre previous to us. You know, because then all that work just gets shot down and it just goes back to square one. And then, you know, later on, another governor might want to restart it. But, you know, right now, it's I'm happy that it's continued. 
Bungen Governancial for the UN. You're so right about the United Nations because yeah. um, the United States has been looking for a reason to take Guam off the list for a very long time. And in fact, you mentioned a visiting mission to Guam. And the last time that a visiting mission to Guam took place was when the U.S. allowed the U.N. to visit when the Constitution was being voted on. Yeah. And the United yeah. States allowed the U.N. to come and visit because they felt that the Constitution was going to pass easily. So they wanted the U.N. there so then they could quickly, you know, say, get Guam off the list. See, they voted on a Constitution. We got this. It's not your problem anymore. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, as as you and I both know, you it's not proper to do a constitution before you choose the, the status you want. But there are people who think that, but that to me is, you know, that's it's putting the bull before the cart or the cart before the bull. It's it's not the way it's supposed to happen. You know. So yeah, those are those okay. were um interesting times. Again, and so that's why if if Guam was absent from the UN, then you know the United States would use that as a reason to say, oh, Esteban Magofi talked them. Yeah, they don't care anymore. Anyway. They're happy, they're good, they're happy island natives. Yeah, and that's yeah, the, happy you know, with and their food stamps and their military bases. <laughs> but that's another thing, you know, you and I have spoke about is you know, people who you know, here seem to be satisfied with the way of life. They don't understand how fast things are changing and how fast we're losing this way of life that everybody in the world loves. Everybody loves to come to our fiestas. Everybody loves, nobody does hospitality like Chamorros. It's in our DNA. Nobody does it like us. It's from our heart. And that's why people who love this place understand that. But that's going away. But people still here think, oh, it's okay, it's okay, but it's not okay. You know, it's not okay. You you got to fight to save this way of life because once it dies, then now you're like Hawaii. You know, now you're going on the same path, and it, it, everything is just you know it's it's absorbed from the social fabric of life here. And I don't want that because that's what I fell in love with when I came here. You know, when I was in the states, because you know I was born in the states. Man, you don't have any money, tough. You didn't, you didn't eat, you know, nobody's gonna treat you. Nobody's gonna invite you to their house to, to, to eat, you know? I mean, yes, some people do, but most people won't at that time. That's what I know. You, you had to look out for yourself. And if you didn't have what everybody else had, well, tough, tough, you just, you know, nobody, not like here. You know, my friends, we had one drink, everybody gets a swig. We had one snack, everybody gets a little bit. That's how it was. You know, and, that, and that's beautiful. That's why I fell in love with Guam. Because people here shared, they shared from their heart. You know, you go to their house, they demand you eat, you know, and if you don't eat, they're insulted. You know, and then, but when they come to your house, no, they don't want to eat. <laughs> so, you know, I love Guam, man. You know, I'm not, I, there's nowhere else that I feel at home. I like to travel. I like to visit places. But everywhere I've gone, especially in the United States, I feel like they treat me like I'm just passing through. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't feel like I belong there, but just, okay, you're passing through. That's, that's fine. But here on Guam, you get off the plane, shh, man, people are going to invite you to their homes. You know, they, they want you to eat. They give you stuff to take home. It's beautiful. They love it. Mm -hmm. And we can't miss that. Again, I like what you're saying because it's an important reminder that even if we are in this colonial situation and there's all these factors around us that are influencing our choices, right? Our lifestyle, preserving that sense of community is crucial. Preserving that sense of identity, right? So that we don't just kind of uh, lose, you know, because, you know, what you're describing, you know, I, uh, I always, people always ask me about it. And actually somebody was what you said about the fiesta, somebody was just talking to me about that, uh, like last week, you know, and I always tell people, I say, you know, the, the sense of community is still there, but it only comes out sometimes, right? So people say, people always used to say, oh, you know, you can see the Inafamaulik spirit when a typhoon hits and everyone comes out of their houses and they help each other. 
And, you know, actually, I don't know if that would be the case for most people if a typhoon hit now. I think a lot of people would just kind of take care of their own. Some might go out and help. But I say, but um, but I I try to remind people, you know, this is because the way we live now, you feel like you don't need others. You can connect to others when you want to, but you can also do your own thing, live your own life. You don't got to deal with them if you don't want to, right? Money, yeah. sort of the emphasis on money helps helps us live like that, right? But in the past, if you wanted your roof thatched, everybody had to come together to help make it happen. And in exchange, everyone then has to help somebody else. So everyone comes for you, you feed them, you treat them well, they thatch a roof for you. Later that month, you go to that person's house, they'll give you food, they'll give you some tuba, some pugwa, and then you help thatch yeah. their roof. And it, it was the same time, it was the same thing during weddings. I remember my mom had a book of all those who came to help and what they brought. And when it's their turn to have a wedding, my mom was there chopping vegetables or you know, whatever. That's how it was. And that was beautiful. That, you know, that was as close to utopia as you can get. Mm. You know, and I remember also telling you that uh, in my village, you know, basketball was a big thing during the 70s. And after midnight mass, everybody went home, got out of their church clothes and put their shorts on, went down to the village basketball court. And we, we played all night. We barbecued, we drank, you know, it was beautiful. Just such a community spirit at that time. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is going away. It's still there. I think when people come from off island, we, we, we bring it out. But when they leave, mm. we go back to where we came from, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Sidus Masayatan, I we're going to continue this conversation because you are, I believe, you are sort of the most frequent guest, Hungan Magahit, on Fanat. So, I think you have the most episodes um, out of anyone. And so, we're going to bring you back, of course, and we're going to continue this conversation. But, uh, do you have any final thoughts? sort of that you want to share in terms of, because, you know, a lot of people who have been watching, they've been responding to how you've been describing sort of the loss of community. Um, I think a lot of people feel like this is resulting, this is the result of economic factors, right? That um, it's hard to feed a village nowadays, right? Um, I mean, I've, I have three kids right now. I have a fourth one that's coming in, in just about six weeks. And I look at my girlfriend's uh, grandparents who had 12 kids and I can't imagine how that could have been possible because yeah. I, I can't, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be pulling my hair out for four kids. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be thinking about holding up a, you know, <laughs> holding up a, a tour bus or something like that to make a little bit of extra salapi. So what are yeah, your yeah. thoughts that you well, have some final thoughts? Have one thought I have, you know, that we already shared is, you know, we got to become more self-sufficient when it comes to food, vegetables, and, uh, you know, other ways to, to let, spend less money. You know, the reason why uh, your, you know, Desiree's grandparents were able to raise 12 kids was largely because there was so much resource at that time. More, much more than there is now because there are less and less people who farm and do animal husbandry. But back in the day when, you know, I, I was here, food was never a problem. You know, it was plenty of fish, plenty of seafood, plenty of, you know, pork, you know, you name it. But that's not the case now. But now, it, you know, I think, like I said, uh, if you remember uh, this Albert Einstein quoting, he goes, I don't know what will be used to fight World War III, but World War IV, IV will be fought with sticks and stones. So, you know, it makes, it makes me realize you have to come full circle. You know, there's, people are gonna, be, are gonna be forced to start cutting costs. And part of that cutting cost will be to start raising your own chickens and eggs and growing fruits and vegetables and relying less on supermarkets to get your supply. That's what I see happening. Now, is that gonna be enough to have fiestas? No, but it's gonna be enough to, you know, to be, it's gonna be enough for your family and maybe your, your siblings. So that, that's, just, that's where you got to start to me. You got to start uh, having the resources to sustain yourself and your family. Yeah, 
I appreciate all of our conversations. And so, para hamzu ni ume egads para ume ekungok si dus masi nu hamzu lokpi para itenchon minzu. Adios, este kimana li hetalo.